Paul's going to be talking here about, we're going to look at four things. Certainty is number one of them. Certainty. Paul's intense expectation. The use of his body, number three, to display Christ. And then finally, what life and death not only was to Paul, but what it actually is. That's what's going on in these verses here because God wants us to know, to know, to know, to know for sure that all that he has said and promised is true. And so you have these passages here and these verses in specific. In verse 19, Paul says, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer, and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I will be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. And then this so famous, familiar verse, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now we'll stop there. And we'll look at some of the other verses a little bit later. But there was a bumper sticker on the back of a van that said, maybe. And that's final. Sounds like something a parent would say to a kid. Maybe. And that's final. Uh, But that's not the way God speaks to us. He doesn't speak to us in maybes. He speaks to us in certainties. All the promises of God to the believer are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And God wants us to know that. Paul was completely certain of his ultimate deliverance. So what I mean by that is this. He was anchored firmly in the fact that Christ was ultimately going to deliver him from this present world. When you read 2 Timothy, he talks about that. He says, I'm I'm confident that God is going to deliver me from this present world, this present evil world. Well, wait a second, Paul. Are you going to get out of prison? Is that what you're talking about? Paul is just talking about the fact that he was getting ready to finish the race. We know, according to church history, that he was martyred after he wrote that epistle. So evidently to Paul, to God, that deliverance ultimately ultimately means coming from this world to the next. And that anchored him in all that he went through on this side of eternity and that certainty fueled his devotion for Christ. You know, a lot of the people you think that are on fire for the Lord, they've got great testimonies, they do the most for Christ, aren't people who are always wondering, am I going to go to heaven? Or I'm doing this so God's pleased with me and I can finally get in. No, they're already certain of God's acceptance of them and the fact that he's going to bring them home to be with him. And it, it fires them up. And that's one of the reasons why Paul turned the world upside down. Of course, he was a unique guy. Um, singularly gifted and used by God, which is why a lot of people were jealous of him, you know, in some ways. But, but we don't have to have the gifting of an apostle, the genius of Paul, you know, the, the gift to work miracles or write scripture to be devoted, to be a man or a woman of God who has the same heartbeat as Paul. And I believe that's why God has this here in the scriptures. Not just for us to read Paul's history, history and be like, wow, what a guy. You know, sounds good, but um, mine's a little bit different. I'm going to be a Christian who just kind of slides into heaven. You know, because I'm not as good as him. God is putting him before us, so we would desire the same thing. And the first thing we're taught here is the certainty of Paul. He knew that all of his current circumstances were temporary. Now, as you read on here, and we'll finish this later on in the message, we'll see that Paul knew by the Lord that he was going to be released. He knew that the current sentence that he had where he was chained to the Praetorian Guard wasn't the permanent one. But he knew that every other circumstance, no matter what was going on, was transient. It was temporary. And so... When we look at his deliverance, the deliverance he ultimately looked for was the one out of this world into the next. And it shaped everything. Three words or three, one word, three different phrases are important to look at up close. Look at verse 19. He says, for I know. And you might say, okay, you're going to look into I know? Yes. We're going to look into the word know because it means certainty a confidence from being personally 
convinced. So you think about that. Yes, Paul saw the Lord. Paul wrote scripture. Um, Paul heard from the Lord. He saw angels. He was called up to the third heavens. So you might think, well, of course he was convinced. Well, no. Yes, he believed. But in every situation that he was thrown into by God, God used it to convince him more and more of God's faithfulness. He was a man, just like you and I. In other words, or a woman. Paul was, you might not be a man. Anyway, back to the text. Got to be careful with that. He had to learn to trust the Lord. And he had to experience God ministering to him through these trials so he could become more and personally convinced by the Lord. And that's what he's saying here. I know him. That's why in 2 Timothy, he says, he says I know whom I believe. And I'm persuaded. And so that's the first word to look at. The word for turn out for my deliverance is a direct quote from the Septuagint version of the Old Testament. And you might think, I don't even know what a Septuagint is. That's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Paul's familiar with it. He's quoting Job chapter 13, where Job says those very words. It's right after the verse where Job says, though he slay me, I will trust him. Take note of that. And then the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ in verse 19, that word for supply comes from the Greek word used to describe a chorus when a festival was put on and they had singers and they had dancers and you had all these different parts of the festival and it was generously supplied by certain donors. So the Holy Spirit is generously supplied by the Father and there's different things that he brings to us. Like the festival had different components to it. The Holy Spirit brings to us his power. We like that. We need his strength. That's how you're going to get raised from the dead, by the Holy Spirit who's in you. Aren't you glad that it's not up to you to raise yourself from the dead? Comfort, guidance, intercession. Remember, he prays for us. He illuminates our mind. You're reading the word of God. He's the one who teaches you. And then he brings fruit and assurance as well. So all of this is lavishly supplied by the Holy Spirit. What is he saying here? I'm personally convinced because of my relationship with Christ. I'm familiar with the scripture. Paul was a man of God who studied the word of God and was convinced by the word of God. He didn't go by his own feelings, his own emotions. You know, the older you get, the more you realize that when you were younger, you had a lot to learn. Although when you're a lot younger, you think you know a lot until you make some mistakes. Most of us know who John Wesley was. Listen to what he said. When I was young, I was sure of everything. In a few years, having been, having been making mistaken a thousand times, I was not half so sure of most things as I was before. And at present, I'm hardly sure of anything but what God has revealed to me. What's he saying? Got a little bit older. A lot of learning to do. I realized the one person I can depend on is God and his word. And that's what Paul's saying here. I'm convinced. I know the scripture. He's saying, I also know, and this is mysterious. We don't have to understand how it works, but God will answer your prayers. I'm going to be delivered through your prayers. He was telling the church that God has chosen to respond to the church. And that's how it works. God listens to the effective, fervent prayer of righteous men and women. And so that's why he was unshakable and he was certain that God was, because he's ultimately going to deliver Paul, that this present situation he, is, he was in was temporary. You might be going through a really hard time right now. Confused, difficult, questioning, uh, wishing it was over. It might seem like it's never going to end. It will end. It might end in death, but it will end. The ultimate victory that we're guaranteed is our salvation. And Paul's going towards that. He wants this to be like a stake driven into the ground for us that we also can remain unmovable. Somebody said, 
A man with one watch knows what time it is. A man with two watches is never sure. So don't get two watches. <laughs> What's he saying? What's that mean? In other words, you got one, you look at it. That's how you're telling time, right? Don't get confused. Paul had his timing on earth. Paul had his direction right from God. That's why he was so confident. Even if things around him were moving and people had different opinions and situations changed, difficulties came, he looked at the watch God gave to him. He said, my time is in his hand. I have the ultimate deliverance from him. It didn't shake him. It didn't move him. He had his peace. We need that. Christianity is based on a fact. The fact of Christ's death and resurrection. Not on just information or people's opinions or people's philosophies or ideas. The fact of the resurrection God wants us grounded in that. Somebody said this. And I can't pronounce his name, so I won't try. God is God, and he has underwritten the future. God is God, and he has underwritten the future. In other words, he signed his name to pay. He's assured it to us. And that's why Paul's saying, I have an earnest expectation. And it means it has, he has an intense expectation. I have an expectation for something to happen in my life because I know that God has guaranteed rock solid the future. The word for expectation means to stretch out the neck. To stretch out the neck. So if you're in a restaurant and you've been waiting a long enough time and your food hasn't been served, what do you start to do? So kind of look out there for your waiter or your waitress, right? You start stretching your neck out a little bit. You kind of want to know what's going on here. You have an intense expectation for the meal that you've ordered. Uh, or let's say you put an application out there to a school or for a job or something, and you're waiting for a letter of acceptance in the mail. What do you do every day? Looking out the window for the snail mail to come, right? You still use that? Where is it coming? You're looking. It's the idea. Or a wedding. You see the groom? He's standing there. He's waiting for his bride to come. And she takes a little bit longer because he can't wait to be married. He starts doing this. Right, he wants to see where she's coming. And as the pastor, you kind of have to pull him back a little bit and say, just wait, buddy, she'll be here. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> Why? Because he wants to be married, right? He has this intense desire to be married. And what Paul is saying is, I have this earnest expectation. I'm stretching out my neck and this hope, and the word there for hope means confident expectation, that in nothing I'm going to be ashamed. In other words, I know that I won't be ashamed of my faith in Christ. If you believe in Christ, you will be never put to shame, never let down. But here's where he's going with it. But with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Wait, that's your expectation? Yeah. What he's saying is, my desire, ultimately, my expectation is to be used by Christ to magnify him, to make him big, to make him known. That came from a personal relationship with Christ. He knew him. He knew how trustworthy he, he is. And so he determined that what I've been given by God is his, and I want God to use this body, this vessel, to make him known. So when we think of magnification, you're thinking of making something that is smaller in appearance, larger. So like our son, you look at the sun, you know, but just by looking at it by the naked eye, that's very large to be able to heat the earth. But there's no way we'd be able to tell just how large it really is unless we had technology, a telescope, right? So what do we learn by the use of a, tech, of a telescope? That you could fit 1.3 million earths inside of a sun. That's how large it is. And I think the earth's pretty big. But man, the sun's even bigger. And if you go past that to like beetle geese, I think that's 950 times the size of the sun. And then there's one star out there. It's a giant red star. The volume of it is apparently like 5 billion times the volume of the sun. I mean, how could you tell that by just looking at it? Well, by a telescope, right? And so here's what Paul is saying. That God wants the use of our bodies to make him bigger to other people. That's, our bodies aren't our own. When, when we get saved, when the Holy Spirit comes into us, we're his. We're now sealed with the Spirit, and we're purchased by the blood of Christ. This is what Paul is telling the Corinthians. This is why it's so important, by the way, to keep these bodies holy, set apart to him, because they're not our own. 
We're his. We're bought with a price. And who does he want to magnify himself to? Well, the church, right? We see just how awesome a big God is through the life of Paul, but also to those who are lost, to those who are far away. God says, I want to use your body to make myself bigger to them so they see me. God has chosen to use human, human instruments. And what he does, as we've seen in the life of Paul and other of the apostles and many people throughout church history and in our lives as well, he uses more acute magnification by suffering more than blessing. So I want to be really careful with this because God can use both, right? God can use his blessing in somebody's life to show how good he is, right? Um, so we see that in the life of Job. Job didn't even know what was going on behind the scenes. The devil comes to God. God says, have you observed him? Yeah, I've observed him. Man, you've blessed him. You've hedged him in. I can't get to the guy. Of course he's going to bless you. Of course he's going to fear you. Of course he's going to hate, hate evil. And so when other people looked at Job's life, they would say, man, what a blessed man. And they were right. They were right. So God had poured into Job's life. He had much cattle. He had great amounts of wealth. He had a large family, you know, and um, that's how people knew that God had blessed him. That's one way they knew. But what happened when everything was ripped from him? And one day he loses all of his kids, all of his livestock. It's destroyed. Basically all of his wealth and all of his children are taken from him. And he says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Wow, wait a second. God's magnified. He's just been blessed through a man who's lost everything. And then we know the second stroke by the enemy. His flesh is struck by the devil. He has boils from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. The whole body is covered in boils. Right? And God is allowing this to happen. And we have the record of this. And Paul quoted Job. Why did God allow this to happen? Because in the unseen realm, there was a test going on. But also in the seen realm, God writes the record of Job and of course the people who were his contemporaries for us to know how awesome God is and how he can keep this man in the midst of suffering. And he can make a man or a woman love him so much that even if everything is stripped, everything's taken away, that God gave him all the blessings, that he can still be blessed. And that focus is sharpened when a man like Job says, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. And my eyes will see him stand on that day, my eyes and not another. Talking about his re redeemer, knowing that his redeemer lives. Man, God chose to sharpen the focus and magnify himself through the life of Job in the midst of testing. And aren't we thankful for it? That we know how good and merciful and sustaining God is through their suffering? What if, what if you were going through a really difficult time and God just kept blessing everybody else? You, you'd think, I must be condemned. I must have done something wrong. This has got to be out of sync with the will of God because I'm not being prospered. They have their health. They have their wealth. You know, they don't have problems. And I've got all these things going on. Well, you're thankful that this is recorded for us. You don't wish the evil that came upon them, but you're thankful because you can identify. You're like, wait a second. Thank you that they went through these things. And not only did they go through it, he sustained them. And not only did he sustain them, he sustained them and they had joy. And they loved him anyway, to the point where Paul would actually say, I'm, my anticipation, I'm looking with eager, intense expectation for God to magnify himself in life or death. In life or death. That's a man who knows Christ. That's a man who understands, who knows what life really is. Somebody said this. Life is what we are alive to do. Life is what we are alive to do. And we understand on a certain level what that means, right? Like you, 
Some of you right now, if I was to say, man, what does it mean? Like, when you say these phrases like, man, now this is living. You ever been done that? You're like, you're on the golf course. Maybe you like to golf. You're on the golf course. You're in your cart. Your buddy's next to you. Maybe your wife likes to golf with you. But it's probably your buddy, right? And he's next to you. And like, man, beautiful day. I'm, I've only bogeyed one or two holes. The Lord is good, right? This is a lot. This is great, right? Until you get angry and you throw your club because you've had a bad hole. Not that I've done that, but you have. And then, or maybe you don't like to golf. Maybe you like to fish, right? I love fishing. It's just so oh, quiet and just, they're jumping out and jumping. They're jumping on the hook, right? It's a great day. Maybe you like to hunt, just sitting in a stand, Sitting out there alone with your coffee and your gun, just waiting to mow down the next innocent deer is coming out for a meal. You just can't wait to drill it. Like, you think it's the you think it's living the deer's like here I am, you know, just comes out with a bullseye on the side. Bam! This is this is what it's all about. The beach. I say, what does it mean to live? You're like the beach. It's laying there in the sun with the sand sticking in your ears because the oil and the sweat. And you got to carry all your kids back to the van full of sand, dragging your cooler, burned to a crisp, dehydrated and screaming all the way home. That's life. <laughs> Maybe it's shopping. You love to take your wife shopping. You love to go to the fabric store and touch all the fabric with her. Or when she goes off, and she, and she might be like, I, this, like, this is where I come alive, right? And she goes into the fabric store or to the garden center, and you might go over to, like, the sporting goods store. Or you might go to, like, the books. That's why I, I like to go wherever those, like, looking, reading through things. Or you might be, like, what I end up doing is sitting on a bench, staring. <laughs> like, now this is what I'm talking about, right? Just staring off into nothingness. But you understand that. We can identify. Somebody saying, no, this is great. Listen, listen to what this Roman inscription came from in, in Carthage. This guy scratched it in into some monument in Ethan Carthage. He said, to laugh, to hunt, to bathe, that's nice, to party, this is life. You can just imagine a guy. Throwing a spear at an animal, yeah, and hanging out with his friends, and then they're roaming baths, and just, this is life, right? Is it? The question is, is he saying that now? What Paul's saying here, in verse 21, is life is Christ. Life is Christ. For me to live is Christ. He's saying, God has so gotten a hold of him. He's so experienced Christ. He knows who he is that he excites Paul. If you wanted to have a conversation with Paul, he wanted to talk about the Lord. It's not that he was, you know, unaware of the other good things that God could bring into your life and appreciate them, but it was about Christ. I think he might make a lot of us uncomfortable. Really, because, not just because he went out and just did things all the time for the Lord. That came from a source. He wasn't just a zealot trying to do good things to earn his way to heaven. He was forgiven. He knew Christ. He was a man who was filled with, with passion for the Lord, and he loved him. His conversation would be about Christ. His, his passion would to be to build you up. Somehow, if he showed up at a church... I have no doubt that he would make a lot of us, maybe me included, just kind of like, ah, oh, man, he's really challenged me on that one because he was, as we say, sold out. Like he was given to him, but it came from a personal experience. He's like, no, I love him. I know him. He excites me. He's what I live for. God magnified himself in Paul, and he's saying here, he's putting this all before us so that we have the same heart. It's not so we walk away and say, well, that's Paul. Of course he's Paul. The rest of us are just, you know, second class, third class, almost like a caste system, Christian. We just kind of slide into heaven and God just says, well, there you are, but Paul, and you guys know. For we'd all have the same heart 
that Christ is life. So let's put this question before all of us alone. Let's not answer the question for our spouse or for our children or for our siblings or for our friend. Answer this question for yourself. Fill this in. For me to live is what? And be honest, because the Lord knows. For me to live is what? I have some answers for you. You might, see, this isn't even like you have to write it in yourself. I'll give you the answer, and then you can check them off. It's like a multiple choice. Pleasure. Wealth. Food. Some people live to eat. Alcohol. Working out. Diet. Just staying, you know, that's, that's what you do. Work. Vacation. Weekends. Sports. Music. Learning. Success. Fame, being known, making your mark. Family. A relationship, a personal relationship that you're pursuing. Or your own beauty. Hobby. You have a hobby that you're giving yourself to and you found like this is really what I'm all about. Sex. Our culture's given over to it. Winning. Last service I said, you know, if you take a baseball bat, you got a baseball bat, you turn it upside down, you grab the handle, right? And you put it out in front of a few of your friends. One of them will automatically do what? Right? And Because there's some people like that. I got to get up. I, 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 I got to win. That's what life is, beating the other person. None of these things will satisfy you. Some of them, many of them, in and of themselves, are good. Right? God can give you really good things in the right context to bless you. But none of them will satisfy you and none of them will last. You will die. I hope this doesn't turn out to be a morbid message. You will die. Your beauty will fade away like the moth. You guys know I used to be a model for GQ. I mean, come on. Look what happened. This was for you. This is God's magnifying himself in his falling body so you would learn a lesson. No, I mean, seriously, you look at some people and it's God-given, God-given talent, God-given beauty, God-given intelligence. And it's strong for a season. And some people last longer than others. They just have good genes, good DNA, longevity, but eventually it all comes to an end. And God tells us, look, all of the, the fashion of this world, the beauty of this world is like the flower that fades. On my back, on the deck of my of the back of my house, my wife puts a cool little garden around there for me every year. She loves, got a great green thumb. And I like it. I sit out there and I just love the flower arrangements. I don't do any of it. She just does it all. I'm like, thanks, it's beautiful. But you know, if you don't water it every day, they just dry up real quick and oftentimes they die. But by the end of the summer, going into the fall, it's like every year. It's like I learned a lesson every year. They die. The annuals, they go. Even the perennials fade. You don't take care of them. But God just always reminds me. He's like, look, everything in this world is temporary. It won't last. The things that we go after to satisfy us, even the good things that God gives us, they can't ultimately satisfy you. And you know if you've been around long enough, you'll be disappointed. People, the best people you know, the most well-meaning people, believers, your friends, your spouse, whoever it is, will let you down. Because we're all frail. We're all sinners. We're all weak. None of us are as faithful as Christ, nor ever will be. You will get sick. Your friend, your sibling, your spouse will die. Your job that you, you love, you could lose that. Nothing here on this side of eternity is permanent. What's certain is our future that God has underwritten himself, 
guaranteed. That is the anchor. Everything here is transitory, even the good things. But if we understand, wait a second, in the middle of it all, God wants me, this body, which is also temporary, this isn't the permanent model, and I'm thankful that I don't have to live with this forever. God's got a house made by him directly that's permanent for me and for you in the future. So here, now, we can say, wait a second, he's got that, he's in me, his purpose for me is for him to use me, to show other people his greatness. So other people can know who he is and how exciting it is to know the one who died for me and rose for me. He's alive in me by his spirit. God generously supplies the spirit of God. He teaches us these things. He says, look at Paul. He wasn't crazy. He wasn't a radical Christian. He was a normal Christian. For me to live is Christ. And we should fill that in. What is it really that consumes us? Because I know how easy it is for me to get just drawn into things. And they take up my attention and my desire and my passion. All of a sudden, I'm like, wait, where are you in this, Lord? Is this you? Am I getting drawn away from you? Is, is it still for me to live as Christ? Or these other things in the name of Christ? These good things in the name of Christ. You've heard this said that often the good is the enemy of the best. He's the best. He's saying to you, I'm your reason. What about death? Death is what to you? Fear? Uncertainty. You don't know. Dying is an uncertain thing for all of us. We don't know what that's like, but death, God doesn't want the finality there to be something that we're terrified of or uncertain of or feeling like if I die, is it that you're going to leave it all behind? Leave whatever you have behind for your family to fight over? To be forgotten. Death is to be forgotten. By what? By who? Or is death hell? Because you're not a real Christian. You don't really know him yet. Paul said, death to me is gain. Why? Look at verse 22. If I live on in the flesh... This will mean fruit from my labor. In other words, if I stay here in the flesh, there'll be fruit from my labor. I'll serve Christ. Yet what I choose, I can't tell. Now listen to where he's going with this. I can't tell what to choose. For I'm hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. What's he saying? There's two options here. And God's going to answer it for me. But to stay here... I'll serve him, I'll labor, God will bring more fruit. But to depart is far better. Why would he stay? Look at verse 24. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. The only reason Paul would stay is if God says, Paul, you need to stay for them. Not for you, Paul, for them. And being confident of this, of what? Remaining in the flesh, I know that I'm going to remain and continue with you for your progress and joy of faith that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. What he's saying is, God, I'm sure I'm going to stay for a while. Not to bum you out or for Paul to be bummed out like, I got to stay with these guys. He's saying, I'll stay with joy to serve Christ for your furtherance. That's maturity. For you, no matter what happens. Many of you guys have heard of Adoniram Judson, missionary to Burma. He's on the field. He's in prison for a year and a half. His wife dies. His kid dies. What would you do if you got out of prison? Many of us would go home on furlough. He stayed. And he translated the rest of the scripture into Burmese. Then he died. For them. Because his life wasn't his anymore. I'm going to read this to you. I think this gets the heart of what Paul says, and then we'll wrap this up. Some of you guys might have heard of James Gunthrey. Some of you haven't. He was born into a very wealthy family in Scotland in 1612. He came to Christ because of the influence of Samuel Rutherford, another giant of the faith. Back then, 
Some kings would try to use the church to control all other Christians and to control society. Charles I says, we're going to make everybody Episcopalian. And basically, I'm going to run everything through the church. So some of these guys, these Presbyterians, said, no, we're not doing that. He was one of them. He grew up to love the Lord. He said, I'm not doing it. They signed a covenant to hold to the Reformation. He signed it that day. He walks by this guy, the executioner of the town. They had a town executioner. Can you imagine that? What do you do? I'm the town executioner. Oh, want to come over for dinner? <laughs> Uncomfortable. Well, he walks by the guy, and after he walks by, he tells his friend, I know for sure I'm going to die because of what I just did. Didn't happen for a while. Charles I is gone. Charles II comes in. Charles II says, oh, no, no, no. I'm not going to make you guys be Episcopalian. Don't worry about it. He changes his mind in a year. Everybody's going to be Episcopalian. So I said it. It's the way it's going to be. And if not, you get, you get to die. So he stands before these guys in trial. Listen to what he says. He says, it's not the extinguishing of me or many others that will extinguish the covenant of the work of the Reformation. He said, my blood will contribute more for the propagation of these things than my life in liberty would do, though I should live for many years. Life and liberty. Now, I like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I'm an American. I go for that, right? But what is he saying? He's like, my life, my liberty, me living for years will do less and my death for standing for Christ right here. So his wife comes to visit him in prison because they told him, you're going to be hanged, then you're going to take your head, and they're going to put it on a stake in front of everybody. You want to do that? And then we're going to confiscate your estate when you're done. So your wife and your kids won't have anything. So his wife comes to him in prison. prison this is what he says to her. I consider myself fortunate to be hanged on a tree as the Savior was. I'd like to be married to him. Because she was all about it with him. She didn't beg him to recant or anything. So they did. They put him to death. Here's what he said at his death. The crowd's hushed. This is the way to go. He said, I take God to record upon my soul. I would not exchange this scaffold with the palace or a crown or any position in your church. Blessed be God who has shown mercy to me, such a wretch, and has revealed his son to me. Jesus Christ, my life and my light, my righteousness, my strength, my salvation, and all my desire, him. Him. Do I serve with all my strength and my soul? Him I commend to you. Bless him, O oh my soul, from henceforth even forever. Let your servant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Him. Why did he go? Why did he get hanged? Him. He said, I'd rather stay right here and get hung than any type of crown or any place in your palace. Kill me. I serve him because he loved him. He was convinced of him. He was 49 years old. They hung him, took his head, put it on a pike above the nether brow port of Edinburgh for 27 years. Every time people walk by there, there's his head. That's the guy who said, I'd rather stand on this scaffold than take your place in a palace. Why did he do that? Because of him. When Christ really gets our heart, he reveals himself to us. He magnifies himself to us first. We're like, you're worthy. You are life. You can't explain it. You can teach it. You got to live it. You got to know it because that's who he really is. He doesn't say, I just want to depart and go to heaven. Although he did. He said, I want to depart and go to be with him, with Christ, which is far in the Greek, far, far better. And the word for desire is a strong desire. I have a strong longing to be with him. To depart means to lift the anchor connected to the ship that's in the dock, lift up the mast, and sail away.
Here's the picture. Paul's in the dock, right? He's getting stuff onto the ship. He's taking stuff off the ship. He's getting stuff on the ship, taking stuff off the ship. He's saying, I'm getting stuff from the Lord. I'm giving it to the church. I'm praying for the church, bringing it to the Lord, ministering. But when God says it's time to go, he said, I am gone. Not because he couldn't stand the church. He loved the church. Not because he was just trying to get out of pain. Although he wanted, to, he wanted a new body, he wanted to be with him. When somebody asked Johnny Erickson Tata, they said, she's quad, quadriplegic for over 40 years. What's the most exciting part of heaven going to be to you? And they thought, like, a new body, right? I can walk, I can jump, I can... This is what she said. The most exciting part of heaven, anticipating heaven, is to not have sin anymore. Because sin hinders my fellowship with God. I don't want to have unhindered fellowship with him. She knows him and she loves him. Far, far better. For me to live is Christ, to die is what? Am I afraid? God doesn't want us to be afraid. He wants us to know that when he says time to pull up the anchor and he's the one who pulls up the anchor, that when you give up the ghost as a believer, you are immediately in the presence of the one who's underwritten your future. And how does he underwrite it? He signs it in his own blood. Guaranteed. My prayer is that we'd understand that. That I'd understand that more. That we'd be ready. Because I know that if we're ready and we're really living to see him, that's our desire, we'll be used greatly here for him. To further the gospel, to bless the church, to reach unbelievers, are you ready or are you afraid? It's a great time to take inventory. Fill it in for yourselves. Let's be honest today. What am I really living for? Is it him? Is it Christ? Is that real? Can that really happen? Yes. Ask him. Ask him. He'll reveal himself to your spirit and then surrender to him. Maybe you're here and you're like, I'm not a Christian yet. I think that's true. As a matter of fact, I know that's true. But if you were to die today, you would die in your sins. And you wouldn't hear him receive you. You would hear on the last day him saying, depart. That's a sober reality that you have to hear. Because to reject Christ means you will be eternally rejected. Is that what you're going to hear? That's not God's will for you right now. He's giving you an opportunity to repent and to surrender to him. That means that you turn from your sin you put your trust in Christ, ask him to forgive you, and ask for him to give you new life, to make you born again. That's something you have to ask him. If you know he's doing that, if you know he's speaking to you, get that right today. And then you'll be certain of eternal life. Let's stand and close with a word of prayer.